Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name's Pearl, and today I welcome Dr. Jacqueline Fulvio, who's going to be speaking um, to us today and leading this webinar. Um, Dr. Fulvio received her PhD from New York University, working with Dr. Lawrence T. Maloney, and she took a Bayesian approach to investigating how the visual systems, um, how the visual system incorporates prior knowledge and experience to form complete perceptions from incomplete sensory information. And currently, her research at the University of Wisconsin Madison with Dr. Brad Possel is focused on cognitive neuroscience with the goal of understanding the neural correlates of visual working memory. Um, today, she will share with us a web tool she has developed, um, which she reported in a publication called Gender Imbalance in Citation Practices in Cognitive Neuroscience um, at the Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience, um, as well as give us one year update as to how the publication tool has impacted publication and citation rates at this journal. So, um, Dr. Jacqueline Fulvio, if you want to take over. Sure. All right. <clears throat> Okay. All right. So uh, thank you very much for inviting me to speak to you today about our web tool. Uh, it was developed during the pandemic shutdown and it quantifies gender citation balances in manuscript reference sections or the GCB ializer as we'll call it. Um, and so thank you for taking the time to join in and listen. I've been looking forward to our discussion and actually the opening discussion we've had for a few minutes now has been very insightful and I look forward to hopefully addressing your questions throughout the talk and otherwise feel free to ask anything outstanding. Before we jump into the nuts and bolts of the tool though, I just want to begin with an introduction uh, describing some of the research that motivated its development. Then I'll show the tool to you in action, describe what happens a little bit under the hood and then I'll come back, as Pearl said, uh, and to the bigger picture and briefly discuss how the tool is currently being used in our recent, recent assessment of its impact. So this project began way back when in 2020, which feels like a long time ago by now, uh, shortly after the pandemic shutdown occurred here in Wisconsin. Um, like many scientific fields, neuroscience has been confronting gender imbalances, and this has been brought to the forefront in a recent study at that time by Jordan Jworkin, Danny Bassett, and their colleagues. Uh, and so on a positive note, they showed, as you can see here uh, in this plot, that papers authored by women in the first and or last authorship position, which I'll henceforth call women-led papers, has steadily increased over the last two decades in five broad scope neuroscience journals. So those included Brain, Journal of Neuroscience, Nature Neuroscience, Neuroimage, and Neuron. So these are um, five of the field's flagship journals. But a concern uh, is that the frequency with which these papers are cited are uh, uh, is not balanced. So there are Im imbalances in the citations and it's also been shown in other fields as well. So um, Dworkin and colleagues addressed this question. They were motivated by the fact that there are downstream effects of citations on a researcher's visibility and their career advancement. So understanding the role of uh, gender in citation practices is a critical step in addressing scientific inequity. So specifically, they investigated whether the citations in these journals reflected the categorical authorship breakdown that we are seeing here. Um, and basically they're using this categorical authorship breakdown as a proxy for what uh, the field of neuroscience, uh, neuroscientists looks like. And they define that as the base rates if gender is not a factor in citation choices when preparing manuscripts. And so I, I'm plotting here, uh, reproducing the results of the actual citation rates for the four categories. And the results indicated that the authors, uh, articles published by men as first and last authors, henceforth MM articles, have been cited more frequently than the base rate, whereas women-led publications have been cited less frequently than the base rates. And so um, this is showing that there's some imbalance here. And it's not shown here, but they found if anything that this gender gap in citations has increased over time. 
But, you know, of course, we should keep in mind that this is uh, a broad view of a very diverse field. So this is just neuroscience in general. And there are many subfields to neuroscience. So we asked whether this trend general generalizes to more focused domains where base rates and citation practices may look different than uh, the broader field as a whole and where interventions may have more impact. So we focused on the subfield of cognitive neuroscience and that's the field in which we carry out our research. And so what we did was we undertook the uh, same approach as uh, Jorkin and colleagues. We reviewed the authorship and citation patterns in the subfield's flagship journal, the Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience. And as we can see here in this figure, which looks somewhat similar to the one we just saw, uh, in the last decade or so, the categorical gender breakdown in authorship has been generally stable with a slight upward trend in the proportion of WW uh, authored papers. And so also noteworthy as we uh, look at this plot is that the uh, percentage of women-led publications has been markedly larger by about 14 to 15% in the Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience than that of the, the five broad scope journals that were um, we looked at on the previous slide. So our next question, of course, was, um, you know, are, do these authors get uh, cited at the rates that we would expect given this authorship breakdown? So what we did then was we um, use these as our base rates, and then we went ahead and did, looked at citation rates. All right, so before we can reveal the journal citation practices, though, I do need to step back a bit further and explain the approach we took, because there's a lot to get to this result. So the analysis was carried out over the summer of 2020 uh, as part of a 10-week research experience program. And I actually want to take a moment to talk about this program simply because of some of the, the discussion that we had at the start of the talk here. Um, this program is called PREP, so Psychology Research Experience Program. Um, it is uh, in the US, it's an NSF or National Science Foundation funded program that is intended to provide summer research experience to students from underrepresented groups in psychology who may not have opportunities for research at their home institutions in order to prepare them and improve their resumes for graduate school. And so our student this summer was a Larry. Uh, he has just graduated and will be starting a PhD program in the fall. And so he uh, uh, helped us carry out this analysis um, on our uh, data here. And so despite the remote nature of the program, what's impressive was that the project resulted in a published paper and paved the way for the development of the tool. So I'm proud, proud of his work. Uh, and yeah, I'm looking forward to sharing it with you. So what we did was we took a multi-stage approach. Um, broadly speaking, the method utilized open source R code that was developed and used by the previous authors, Jordan Jorkin uh, and his colleagues. Um, and uh, what we did was we modified and customized the, customized the code as needed for our Journal of uh, Cognitive Neuroscience specific version of the analysis. Okay, so to begin, we this is sort of a big data project. Uh, we downloaded metadata for the 2,106 research articles that were published in the journal in this time range, also studied by Jordan Dworkin and colleagues. So January, 2009 to at the time, July, 2020. And these data were available from Web of Science. So anyone can go to Web of Science, this website here and download metadata from any journal. Uh, and essentially it comes in a series of text files um, that are rather difficult to look at, but using the some basic R code, uh, we were able to organize the data into a large table, looks something like this. Um, and this is a, just a small snippet. And we combined the metadata from the Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience with the uh, uh, metadata from the five broad scope journals that were analyzed previously for reasons that will become clear shortly. Okay, so now we have this large set of information about all of the articles 
published in JOCN from January 2009 to July 2020. Uh, and then we uh, had to go ahead and determine the gender category of each JOCN article. This had to be done probabilistically, uh, simply because there's just so much data here. Um, so let's take an example article. I just highlighted one here. The first author was named Simon, and the last author was named Sabrina. So our, in this case, it's um, there's only two authors. In papers that had more authors, we focus still on the first and last because that's the convention in our field that those are the senior authors. Um, okay, so what we then did with these names was queried them within the uh, Social Security Administration's baby name data sets that's in the US. And if the name wasn't found there, it was queried through uh, genderapi.com, which is a, a website, um, an interactive um, uh, site. And what that does is it relies on census and social media data. So when people fill out a social media profile and indicate their gender, that information is available in genderapi.com. And so ultimately, uh, we were able to obtain a probability of each name as belonging to a man or a woman, okay? And if the probability of belonging to either gender was 0.7 or greater, this was the criterion used in the uh, Dworkin et al. study, so we just followed suit, that gender was assigned. And so the article here was categorized then as a man, woman, uh, or MW article. Okay. So we did this for each of the uh, 2,106 articles published in the journal, and that resulted in a column of author group categories. And as we can see on the right, we have WM, MM, MW, and so on. Okay. Uh, just as another note, solo authored papers became either MM or WW, just so that we had some consistency in our, in our um, uh, labels here. So now this column allowed us to derive our expected base rate. So the idea is that uh, these are our population of authors in the field. We're, we're using this as a proxy for what the field looks like. And so if citations are, um, equitable and matching the, the rates in the field, then they should match the rates of uh, MM, MW, and so on that we're seeing in the journal. Okay, so these are our base rates. Uh, we were able to um, determine them for each year from 2009 to 2020. And that gave rise to the plot that we saw just moments ago. And now what we needed to do was quantify the citation uh, Great. So what did they actually do in terms of their citation practices? So the metadata, as you can see here, does contain a column of all of the uh, reference section information. And it's, it's got a lot of detail to it. Um, and so the actual articles themselves, this is uh, a citation list from one of the JOCN articles, um, only includes first name initials. So for example, Albin RL. So that's kind of problematic for our ability to uh, categorize them uh, by author group. However, the metadata contained uh, DOIs. So at this point, you've published some papers now, you see that each one comes with a DOI. So the DOI is um, a unique number that traces back to a lot of information about the article, the title, the author's publication year, and so on. So, um, uh, what we were able to do was leverage those DOIs and use them to as basically a way of looking up and referencing other DOIs in our list. So um, we have all of our JOCN articles. We also have all of the 63,000 plus articles from the five broad scope journals. Each of these have a DOI. So what we can do is uh, go through these reference lists look for DOIs that have a corresponding uh, entry in our um, you know, six journal uh, table here and use that at basically as a lookup to see the uh, author gender group of the citation. 
Now, we know for sure that people aren't exclusively citing journals from only the uh, only making citations from these six journals, but for now, this was the best that we can do. And so we were able to categorize about 20% of the citations overall, which isn't um, very much. But when we get to the web tools, we'll uh, talk about how we improved upon that. Um, but we did have to, we did take an additional uh, step of removing self citations. So there are um, known differences in self citation rates where uh, men, uh, male authors tend to cite themselves more than female authors. And so we wanted to remove this as an additional factor. And so as a result, we were down to about, you know, 14 or 15% total citations categorized um, for analysis. And at that point, we can say, all right, so of those uh, citations categorized, what did their author gender uh, groups look like? And how does that compare to the base rate? Okay. All right, we'll move on. And so here we have that plotted on the right um, um, in the similar format that we saw for the Dworkin paper. So inspection of the citation rates on the right reveals that MM papers uh, were cited at 57.9%, and that's more than half of the time. Um, and so they've been cited more frequently than we would expect given the base rates, which was uh, you know, closer to about 42%. Uh, and vice versa for women-led papers. Um, so this suggests that the imbalances that we observed for the broader neuroscience field did apply also to our subfield of cognitive neuroscience. But it is of course important that we put the citation patterns into context by explicitly factoring in the base rates in order to determine the true extent to which citations are either over-cited or, or under-cited. Um, and so to that end, we're going to label the citation rates as observed proportions. These are what we observed when people made their reference lists. And the base rates are going to be the expected proportions. And with some very simple math, we can compute a gender citation balance index. So we just subtract the expected from the observed and normalize by the expected. So with this index, a value of zero uh, indicates that the citation rate was uh, just as we would expect given the base rates. Positive uh, values indicate over citation of a particular category and negative values indicate under uh, citation of a particular category relative to the expected. And so here is our, um, uh, here's an example for the MM paper. So the um, uh, observed proportion was 57.9, as we saw on the previous um, slide. The expected overall that, that full decade was 40.8. And so we had an index of 0.419, which is very positive. So that, that is a, an over-citation of the category. What about for our remaining categories? They were under-cited. Uh, so um, yes, so basically our results mirror those that were shown for the five broad scope journals. Um, and then of course we could say, do different author groups show different citation patterns? Is this really being driven by one particular type of author group? Or is this something that's just kind of a broad uh, practice among all of our author groups? And so when we look at um, the citation balances for papers authored by a man in the first authorship position and the man in the last authorship position, we see the same pattern. So they are sort of faithful to the overall pattern. Um, however, this group is not the sole driver of the outcome as we see a similar pattern for our um, WW authored papers and our mixed gender author papers as well, with some slight variation overall. So what we showed at this point was that uh, gender imbalances in citation practices of the broader field of neuroscience generalized to our uh, subfield of cognitive neuroscience. And the pattern of these imbalances is consistent across authorship gender categories which implicates something more systemic in uh, uh, driving the behavior. 
Um, and so what's a field to do, okay? Um, and certainly calling attention to findings like this is a great start. And we see this happening uh, across domains, actually, um, not just in our own. Uh, but beyond that, this is where our uh, Gender Citation Balance Index web tool, or GCBI Elizer, as we were calling it, uh, came in. So after we wrapped up the analyses that summer and we prepared the manuscript to report the results to the journal and to the field, I spent a month or so at my kitchen table in the fall of 2020 developing the web tool. And as you can see by my background, I've since been released back into the wild of the lab, so that's awesome. Um, but the tool uh, is designed to have authors submit a reference list and then receive the gender category breakdown and gender citation balance indices in return. So just kind of to show you a quick example of how this works, and you can even go to our website later and test it for yourself. So what I'm doing here is I'm pasting in a reference list from a paper my supervisor and I published in the early part of 2020. As it's working, a progress bar advances in green. You can see it going across the, the screen. And several outputs appear in the boxes below, and we will uh, come back to those shortly. All right, so how is this actually working? Um, the, the tool uses a slightly different uh, pipeline than our main analyses used, which offer some advantages to the original approach. So the goal here was to actually improve upon the methods a little bit. So I'm not going to talk about the code itself, other than to say that it is Java and HTML based, and it relies on promise methods for those who may be familiar with Java, and that makes it fairly compact and efficient to run. Okay, so uh, this means that an author, as, as we saw in the example, can simply copy the reference list from their manuscript file, paste it into the box, uh, and uh, get the outputs. What's critical though is that there are DOIs um, present in the reference list. Um, and DOIs typically now are come with citations, but if they're not available, they can be quickly obtained using an, another online tool where again, you copy in your reference list and it gives back the list with the DOIs. That's called the Crossref Simple Text Query Site. And that's actually linked to on, on the webpage with the tool. Um, and a DOI just looks like this, which by now everybody's uh, familiar with. All right, um, and so then the uh, reference list is parsed, the DOIs are then sent to um, some uh, APIs for those who may be a little more web programming minded. A RESTful API is basically just an architectural style for an application um, program and it uses uh, HTTP requests to access data and then use data. So it takes in a, a piece of data and, and then it goes and accesses it in a database and it sends some data back. In this case, it's going to send back uh, some metadata about the particular article that's being referenced. Uh, it looks like this. It's again another big jumble. Um, but the benefit of the data in this format is that it, can, it uh, gives back a lot of information, but specifically in separate fields that make it easy to parse. Um, and the nice thing again, is it also gives it back in a way that we don't need to download a whole bunch of text files, parse them ourselves. Um, just this little bit snippet of Java code can parse this pick out the given names. This is our paper that we published on the JOC and analyses. So we have um, uh, our, our first author's names of Jacqueline, O'Leary, and Bradley. And then what we do is we do a, a similar um, lookup query for uh, the um, uh, gender of the particular names. Um, for that, we chose to use a different lookup spot for the names. We use genderize IO. The reason why we chose this um, was that it's designed to work with fetch. So basically, you can just send a big number of queries and it will send back probabilities associated with the names. 
Um, this particular API is free, which is useful. Uh, many groups can adopt it if they want to do something similar. Um, and the data are collected from all over the web. So in some preliminary testing, we were able to actually categorize many more names than we were with the uh, um, lookup tables that we used for the original analyses. And so uh, again, we get back a probability for the gender and then we can categorize the name. So uh, just as an example, I put in my own name. Uh, it, it, it categorized it as female because the probability was 0.98. So we used the same uh, 0.7 criterion that we used previously. Um, and uh, again, our uh, citations were then categorized in the four categories of man, man, woman, woman, man, woman, and woman, man. Okay. Um, the under the hood is sending out all these queries. So you know you have you might have reference lists of fifty uh, citations, for example. Um, once all the queries have come back, the final statistics are compiled. And that's what is returned in those boxes in our web page. So we'll go back to those. So let's see what they are. So the first thing that it does is it tells us how many of the citations were successfully categorized. In this case, there were 17. And then uh, there are the number of DOIs that could not be categorized due to missing author name data. That's four. Some journals, even in their metadata, don't provide author names information, or occasionally an article's metadata is corrupted in some way. So once in a while, we do have cases where we cannot uh, categorize a particular um, uh, author's name. And then occasionally there are problems with um, DOI formatting and, and that will show up in the, the final box here. The next set of four boxes just uh, tells us the proportion of the citations that were successfully categorized that fell within each of the four um, uh, categories. And then the final four boxes, we have, oh, we do have a mouse. So uh, these provide the gender citation balance indices that are specific for the journal Cognitive Neuroscience. I'll talk about that, why that is in a moment. So what this is saying is that of my 17 citations, 70, uh, six and a half percent of them were male, male. Zero were uh, women, uh, women uh, authored papers. Um, the gender citation balance uh, indices are uh, based on that little formula that we saw earlier, where we take the observed proportions, so that's what we have up here, and we subtract the expected, so that's the base rate for JOCN in our case, and divide by the uh, expected. And so we have a strong positive here. Again, that means an over-citation of the category and a strong negative. And in fact, when I um, plot these results in the usual way, this is what we get. So uh, we can see that our reference list followed the general pattern seen in the broader literature and uh, yeah, so we're, we're no different ourselves. But the face palm here is partly in jest because our goal really is not to shame or blame authors. We just want to put it out there to bring awareness to these imbalances in our citation rates. And actually that brings me to some important uh, caveats and limitations um, of, with regard to this work, both in terms of the uh, pipelines and, and in the analyses and the web tool. Um, the first one, of course, you probably have been uh, pondering this throughout the talk, is that the framework assumes a gender binary, um, uh, well, framework. <laughs> um, and so as a result, that inherently is going to introduce some error in estimates of gender identity of authors uh, where the there may be discrepancies between the name and the probability assigned. It also, this framework does not speak to inequities experienced by non-cisgender individuals and members of the LGBTQ plus community. So we are limited uh, in that way. Um, so it is just 
something that will have to be improved upon going forward in the future. Uh, next, our typical reference list categorization rates for the web tool is much improved over the original analyses at about 60 to 85%. Um, and so, uh oh, we seem to have, okay. <laughs> Um, and so that's great, but we're still missing some references. So it'd be nice if we could, you know, get much higher. Another important thing is that uh, the framework assumes, as I mentioned earlier, that the first and last authors are the lead uh, senior authors on the paper, and that may not always be the convention across domains. So in that case, there would need to be modifications to uh, account for that. Okay. Um, one thing we've found is that uh, if you just have a, a paper that you want to, you know, check on, copying uh, reference lists from PDF documents sometimes introduce some formatting issues that the tool doesn't like so much. So it really does need to be in a document form, which if you're writing a manuscript is not a, a problem with Word or, or so on. But yeah, if you just want to try out some, some papers in your field, uh, it might be more difficult. Okay. Um, we have found and we warn our users of the tool that ad blocking browser extensions can interfere and cause the tool to hang. So it's just, you know, again, some of the clunkiness in dealing with the internet. Um, and the, the thing that I mentioned earlier, the GCBI values, the, the, the second set of four items, those are JOCN specific. So the Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience specific. Um, and so I'm going to get to that on the next slide, but what that means is um, it won't, it may not necessarily be reflective of your particular field if the base rates are different. Okay, yeah, so you, what you would need to do then is go through the process of uh, uh, quantifying authorship in, in your particular field or journal to get the base rates and then use, apply those to the, the compute the indices. All right, so now for the kind of fun part, um, I emphasized that the GCBIs, our, our indices, are, are specific to the Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience. So this brings us to the bigger picture of why we embarked upon this journey. So as we mentioned, my background is in visual perception and cognitive neuroscience and working memory. This is not my usual uh, you know, daily work. So how, what motivated us to do this? Well, at the time this work began, my supervisor, Dr. Bradley Postal, shown here, was preparing to assume the editor-in-chief role at the Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience at the end of 2020 for the journal's upcoming volume, number 33, in 2021. So yeah, 2020 had a lot going on. And one of the underlying motivations of this project from the beginning uh, was to determine whether gender citation balance imbalances exist in the journal as they did, as we saw with other the other five broad scope uh, neuroscience journals. And if so, if we could find ways to take action to see if something could be done to tip the balance. So development of the web tool was specifically to provide a way to take that action and sort of nudge authors to consider their references. So to quote Brad's announcement when he assumed the editor-in-chief role and unveiled the web tool, he said, in an effort to call attention to this problem and to perhaps start remedying it, JOCN encourages authors to estimate the gender citation balance indices of the reference section of their manuscript using the tool at the, the website and to include these metadata along with their submission. So basically, this was going to be introduced as part of the submission process, but a voluntary part. So the first thing that we did was uh, a soft unveil at the end of 2020, we, where we asked our colleagues from around the field to test it out. Put in your reference lists, see what happens. And this allowed me to troubleshoot uh, and make changes to account for any unforeseen uh, little circumstances or bugs. And once performance was stable, the tool was officially introduced as part of the manuscript submission process within the system. 
So the hope was that calling attention to the imbalance might encourage authors to identify additional references that may be less well cited, but equally as relevant in the field when, when where applicable. Uh, but the important thing was that the step is involuntary. So authors uh, submitting authors do not have to do this. And it does not have any direct bearing on whether a manuscript is published in the journal. So reviewers who are you know, sent the manuscript are instructed to not consider the, the uh, gender citation balance indices um, when they're assessing the suitability of the paper for the journal, but instead they're, they were encouraged to take these values into account when maybe recommending to author some papers, additional papers that they could be citing. Uh, and so beginning with the January 2021 uh, first issue of volume 33, all papers published in the journal have included a citation diversity statement um, uh, and authors were invited but not obligated to report their gender citation balance in the statement. So here's an example of the statement from one of our group's recent papers since it was unveiled, um, so over the last year. And the unhighlighted text is boilerplate and included in all the papers. And for those papers in which the authors opt to report the values, uh, a statement like the one highlighted here is included at the end. So these values came from the web tool. Uh, and we can see for this particular paper, the reference list was again, strongly biased toward male uh, male papers. But again, I really want to emphasize the goal here is not to shame authors or blame them, but just to create the awareness. I, it, it is the case that you know sometimes there are not you know sufficient numbers, for example, of WW papers in a particular area to cite. Um, but the idea is that it helps us be more aware of are we getting a broad array of citations where they exist. So the journal has since been keeping a record of the these indices labeled by the iteration of submission. So there's first submission, sometimes there are a couple of review submissions, but then there's also the final publication. And so the goal is to periodically report the results um, to assess the influence of this overall initiative. And so our first report came out in an editorial at the journal earlier this year. So what I did was I carried out the analysis uh, on the data, the the article data um, through the 2021 time period. And it allowed us to quantify the impact of, if any, of the initiative during the year. And so our approach for the report was to carry out all of the steps of the original analysis pipeline so that we could easily uh, combine the data with our earlier data. And we had two primary questions in this uh, um, pursuit. The first was how do these indices for all of the articles published in the Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience during 2021 compare to the indices that we reported earlier for the 2009 to 2020 period? And then we wanted to know for the uh, specific articles in which the authors chose to estimate and report their articles indices. Again, this is voluntary, so not everyone took part in this. Did the intervention influence the published articles uh, indices relative, so from the final publication relative to the previous, the initial submission? So our first step was just uh, undertaking the descriptive exercise of documenting what happened during the first year. And this is just the authorship breakdown. So this isn't looking at citation rates, but what we see is that uh, the authorship breakdown was pretty stable uh, over uh, 2021 compared to 2020. So um, there has been discussion around the field that authorship by women during the pandemic has dropped significantly, but it seems at least um, for JOCN that uh, it's, fairly, it's maintained a fairly stable level. So that's a good thing. Uh, we next considered the citation balances, because that's really what we're, we're interested in here, is our initiative 
ha uh, having any effect. So what we're showing here in the bars, those are the indices from the earlier volumes. So this is what we talked about earlier a few slides. Um, the latest uh, year, uh, 2021, the indices are superimposed with white dashed lines. And so what we can see is that for all four categories, the indices have moved closer to a value of zero to differing extents, but generally there's a reduction of the imbalance. So that's a good thing. I want to emphasize that the white dashed lines correspond to estimates from all of the papers published during the year, independent of whether the authors chose to estimate and report the indices or not. When we take the same data and split out by uh, the gender of the authorship team, we see that there are variations, but the majority of the indices show a reduction towards zero. And so the important thing with the data shown on this slide and the previous one is we can't infer causation, okay? We can only observe these um, patterns of results, but it does appear to show promise. And it's important also to keep in mind that there are many possible factors that give rise to the final values um, at, at submission. So we could speculate <laughs> for days as to what might be driving some of these changes, but that's not really the purpose our, of our investigation here. What we are interested in is the effects specifically of the intervention with the web tool. And so as a more direct test of the initiative, we focused on the papers in which the authors did voluntarily opt to estimate and report the indices. In the first year with this being a new uh, procedure, we've had only 30 author groups of the 135 papers that were published who opted to participate. And what's important to keep in mind is some of the papers that were published had already been submitted and under review in the previous year before the tool was even um, introduced. So um, it's hopefully we'll have more to work with next year when we look at this. Despite the small sample size though, we can draw stronger influences about the influence of the tool by comparing for these particular articles, the indices of the initially submitted manuscript against the indices of the uh, final published article. And uh, as I mentioned, there are uh, a few of the 30 papers were initially submitted before the web tool had become available. So we only had sufficient data for the analysis for 24 articles. So we have a small sample size, um, but what we're showing here is um, the, where the bars are comprise the um, indices from the initial submission, and then the white dashed lines show the indices from the final published uh, version of the paper. And we can see that peer review and revision had almost no effect on the indices for the male male and uh, woman male articles, but there is an appreciable reduction in the imbalance for the uh, male woman authored papers, and to a lesser extent, the women, uh, woman, woman authored papers. So in general, this is indicating that there are more women-led papers being cited as a result of the initiatives. So uh, to quote Brad once again, we are cautiously optimistic that the introduction of the diversity in citation practices statement and the associated GCBIalizer have been effective at combating however modestly, this one systemic inequity in how we communicate our science. So it's our hope that the initiative will continue to have positive impacts going forward at the journal and will inspire other fields and journals to adopt similar initiatives where imbalances exist. And with that, I wanna thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to our discussion and hearing your thoughts. Thank you so much, Dr. Fulvio. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm just going to go through the chat. Um, so Linda said um, she's tried the app on the references for a body image grant um, that she's writing. And the reference list is just as female dominated as body image conferences. 
Um, I, I think there's also a question in the Q and A slide. Um, can you see it? I can't. I can't see it. Oh, I see the question. So the question is, uh, were the citation rates based on only the period where we know the base rates are fairly stable or going back into the period where there were fewer women authors? So this is a really good question. For uh, the Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience, uh, the citation rates were based on only the period where we know things are stable. And that's just because that's uh, only the time frame when that data was available. Prior to 2009, the JOCN metadata didn't uh, include author first name information. So we were unable to um, prepare the, the, the base rates for that time period. However, for the uh, five broad scope um, journals, the, the time frame went back, I believe to 19, 93 or 95. So there's much more time included in the base rates for, for the, the field in, um, more broadly. So the citation rates, when we look, looked back, um, they did include a, a bigger time period. And that's a good point because, um, it, yeah, one might expect, for example, that fewer authors were publishing in, say, Nature Neuroscience back in the 90s compared to more recently. Um, and so that, that would be one of the many factors that contribute to uh, imbalances. And that's the idea is that if we are consistently citing old papers and, and ones that, and, 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 you know, following suit, everybody keeps citing the same papers over again, but we're not including more recent or other relevant papers that maybe are just lesser known, we are missing out on important references. And that's the hope of this initiative is to just have call attention to the fact that we may be, um, you know, missing some important citations in our analyses, uh, in our reference lists. And I think Nadja want to ask yeah. uh, a question. I, I'm very interested in how sure are you about these names? Because, you know, often women have got names which are male kind of names, you know? And uh, I mean, we were grappling with that in terms of race, you know, we were kind of thinking, you know, how can we actually include a list of uh, names to see uh, whether we are just, you know, like, doing the citations of weird populations or other kind of populations. And we came across this kind of problem of how can you actually assign a name to something? So how do you yeah. do that? So I agree, this is another potential uh, limitation or, or challenge for the approach. So the it's done probabilistically and it's based on, uh, well, at least the web tool is based on pulling data from all over the web. So from social security databases, from social media and so on. So uh, it, as I uh, mentioned a couple of times, we set the criterion to have a probability of 0.7, but for a name that may be kind of mixed, like, I don't know, let's say Taylor, there could be that could be male and female. That name just simply would go uncategorized if the probability fell below 0.7. Um, so that is indeed a, a, a limitation. For um, various uh, ethnic groups, so a, a colleague of mine, I tried her name. She has a Chinese name that came back as female, but another colleague, uh, its name did not. So there, it was more ambiguous. It didn't have a, a strong enough probability. So that is another case where we are limited that we may be um, uh, not uh, identifying enough of our, uh, uh, in certain groups. And that's something else that we would hope to improve. The genderized AP, uh, IO API, the one that we're using with the web tool, they're frequently updating their databases and aiming to improve their statistics all the time. And, and, it, and you can actually write to them and provide entries. So um, the, this is something that we, we 
we is a better approach than um, the approach used for the initial analyses. So the hope is that it will get better and better, but it, yeah, it's not, it's not perfect. Another thing is that um, <laughs> when people are choosing to, to cite, um, they could in, uh, we, we don't actually expect that people are sitting there pondering the names of the first names of the authors and and making their decisions that way. But the idea is that we are um, making people more aware of these imbalances and hopefully kind of scouring the, the field more broadly to bring in more references and that hopefully will kind of pull in more, for example, women led papers. But we're not necessarily saying, you know, search just for women and look just for women's names or, 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 you know, we're not trying to assume anything about identities or anything like that. We're, we're really just trying to, um, yeah, improve just overall give more representation to more publications. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Did you get any other um, direct questions? Dr. Bouvier. Uh, it looks like one just came in. Uh, so did you look at the content area of the research? Are some topics cited more than others? Are female or male authors more likely to different kinds of keywords on their articles? Those are good questions, not ones that we have looked at. Um, uh, there was a little bit of investigation in the uh, original study, the Dworkin et al. study, where they looked at, for example, networks of researchers, so their social networks, um, and they removed influence of the basically who you know when you cite, and they found that these biases still existed uh, when you re accounted for that. So it may be that there are, uh, as the person is asking here, there may be, um, you know, particular areas where males tend to uh, publish more or cite more and like vice versa for females. Um, in terms of the keywords, that would be an interesting um, uh, test as well, but not something we've looked at, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then another question came in, could it be that part of the over-citation of uh, male-led papers, MM, is that they tend to publish more in high-impact journals and those are the first papers to come to mind. Yes, I do. That is potentially part of it. Um, we mentioned self citations uh, also tend to be biased. Um, men tend to self uh, cite more than women. And so if there's just this constant frequency of um, citation of certain articles, they tend to become the ones that everybody keeps citing. Um, and so that you may be in a particular research area, you might see the same, let's say five or six citations over and over again, and people keep going with those. And, and so the idea, hopefully with this initiative is that we're causing people to, to break that a little bit and say, what other papers have come out that are related to this? Um, and then that would hopefully uh, bring in a, a broader, more diverse view of the results rather than just say those six. So I do think that is potentially another possible factor. So I have a question. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. um, I, I mentioned before that I, I participate in the focus group uh, led by Pearl and um, kind of just explore like what are the way that we can diversify um, the, the reference list. And one thing that I think I struggle with is just the fact that, um, is it that, and I think maybe you have mentioned this uh, before, like, is it the takeaway that we should try to cite more women or like potentially if this can generate, generalize to other group of like, you know, can we, uh, um, a, a other group of like underrepresented group, then is it the takeaway is that we should try to cite more of others that, other than men men? Or is it that we just can, uh, is, so is your takeaway that we just need to try to a little harder not to, to find other references relevant for the, that particular topic that you're studying and rather than just 
default to the kind of reference that you already know, even though that paper might have been outdated. Um, well, yeah, I just want to make sure. I think I think it's a little bit of both. Um, so in the case of uh, the journal of Cognitive Neuroscience, uh, it is the case that women-led papers are undersighted. So uh, given the number of authors uh, in, in the, the authorship teams in the journal, so that means that people could be um, citing those papers um, more than they are. It doesn't mean we should just stop citing the other papers, you know, if they are relevant, important, meaningful papers, whether they're man, man or man, woman or, or the other categories, we should, we should be citing them. Um, but the other thing to note is that there, there may be fields that go in the opposite direction, right? So it may be that um, male-led papers are undersighted, in which case we want to make sure that we um, uh, include more of those papers as well. So this in general is intended to show that there are imbalances in our field, um, however they went, and that uh, to, to um, suggest that there may be a whole rich literature out there that's just not being cited as well as it should be, and we should keep focused on that. <laughs> so I don't know if there's any other question. Because it's also um, like, right, we write at the one hour mark. So if anyone have one more question or two more questions, uh, just pop that in. Well, if anybody has any questions later, or if you attempt to use the, the tool you can and have any issues or anything, you can certainly, uh, um, you know, reach out and contact me and let me know. <laughs> So is it something that um, JOCN continue will just check every year or do you think that this is just, um, yeah, what, what next for this, I would say? I think for now, we're just gonna keep, keep with it and, and see what happens. Um, you know, the first year, like we mentioned, there were only 24 papers that we could, uh, analyzed for initial submission versus final submission. So the, the question would be, at least in a couple of upcoming years, do we see increased uh, adoption uh, or voluntary use of this initiative? And do we see further impact or, you know, is this just going to be as good as it gets? Um, you know, you know mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, that's kind of where we're at at this point. So, <laughs> so what, what, one last comment is I wish I was, they, uh, there was like um, time series kind of analysis in terms of, because I think you would analyze all the way from 2009 to 2021 and then uh, 2020 mm -hmm. and then just the 2021. So I think it's maybe like, it would be cool to see that you know, the, the up and down of over the year, maybe that would also address early question by Linda as well. Yeah, that would be. yeah. and, yeah, and ho yeah. hopefully, you know, with maybe a little bit more time with the tool, we can we can kind of put that kind of plot together. So yeah, yeah. I don't, I just don't think we had enough data <laughs> in that first yeah. year to do that, but I agree, that would be really nice to see as well. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Thank you, Jackie, for this very interesting talk. And um, but yeah, thank you for coming to Riot. And Pearl, you. do you have any final thing you want to say? Um, no, you kind of answered my question in terms of um, having the tool kind of with um, not just with gender, but for also like diversifying like references of POC. So um, no, but um, Thank you so much. Your tool is amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, hopefully we'll inspire and, you know, keep having some impact here. <laughs> yes, and 